Hello, and welcome to this, the Lord's 76th episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and Magic the Gathering podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yes. We still have a little bit of a delay. The delay is not as bad on the recording this week, I will say. I, I, I messed with the Wi-Fi settings. Like, my computer was only connecting to 2.4 gigahertz when my, my router is capable of 5 gigahertz. So maybe that'll help a little I'm, bit. I'm jacked in directly to the net. Ooh, you're jacking in. I'm hardwired. <sighs> you, that you're very hard wired. Um, so <laughs> yet again, we have a very a very controversial Magic the Gathering episode of the podcast. We've been getting a lot of those recently, and. <sighs> Man, this is this is a big deal. Anyway, we're we're gonna go through the spiel quickly. Um, what am I playing? I'm playing Persona Three episode, I guess DLC. It's fun. It's more Persona Three. Uh, we're gonna be doing a bonus action with uh, with uh, typical Gemini. We're working on scheduling that for a set review for Duskborn. Sam, what are you playing? What am I playing? Uh, really, nothing right now. I just got I had a very busy weekend. Past and uh, past couple mm. weeks have been busy. Uh, however, I will say we did at least. Uh, get some uh, uh, pre-release for Duskborn. And yes, we did. So I cracked those the other day. Uh, I got one good card. I got. I got. Um, I got a couple. Like nothing. I got two copies of Marvin. The the colorless mm. like co- has all the activated abilities of everything, but like nothing super valuable. Uh, there's definitely some like room enchantments that I'm that I'm interested in in testing out in my Yuriko deck just because the mana co- like the converted mana cost of the whole card is yeah, really high. Cost. Um, but like I, nothing nothing too crazy in terms of what I'm doing. Uh, ooh, wait, yeah, no, got, some of the some ahead. of the manifest dread cards in my face down commander deck are probably those make sense there. absolutely. Yeah. It's both selection and yeah. Uh, the only good one I really got was Meat Hook Massacre Two. Oh damn! Okay. Yeah. So this the um, sequel. Feel like I could throw that in my mono black deck. The sequel. I have the regular one in my mono black uh, Sauron deck. I could throw that in there nice. too, but it would just be good stuff. It really wouldn't be in in the game plan to be mm-hmm. honest. But mm-hmm. so you bring up you bring up your Sauron deck, which yes. in the last in the last week I have I, I remembered. Two Gen Cons ago, when we were at our Airbnb, we were playing a five-player game of Commander, and we were doing the, like, Mm -hmm. this person's the king, this person's, like, the guard, these people are, like, trying to assassinate the king. So, I've been working on my Lord of the Rings Commander Cube for a while. Uh, The more Mm -hmm. I think about the process of drafting and the the group of friends that we have and that we play Magic with, I don't know if that's something they would be into. So I'm considering pivoting a little bit and doing like a a play Mm -hmm. on the kingdoms format and do like a war of the rings thing. So like the king has to be a Sauron deck. So one of the multicolor Saurons and now with the recent bannings of cards that we'll be talking about, throw in a jeweled Lotus that I have, that's now worth almost nothing. Throw in the mana crypt that I have. (laughs) That's going to be worth nothing here. We'll get into that soon. So it's like a super powered Sauron deck. And then he gets like one companion player. So like, a Saruman deck or like an orcs deck or something like that. And then all of the various good factions, like you could have an elf deck, you could have a dwarf, you could do a dwarf yeah. deck if you really wanted. I would rule zero, like the, the Gimli and Legolas counter of kills for like a teamer deck, do like the humans deck with Aragorn, like a whole bunch of variety of decks. And then you can get three other people to pick some of those decks and then like have a couple of bad guy decks and you can pick one of the bad guy decks and then just do that as like a five player pod where like the good guys are trying to kill Sauron and the orcs are trying to kill the good guys and all that kind of stuff. Make the Sauron deck stupidly powerful because of in, course. Um... <laughs> I mean, they did just part, uh, print new scheme cards in Duskmorn mm-hmm. uh, for the arch enemy f- um, version that of the game. So that is that's true. also that. Also, yeah. You know, we, could, we could include it. We could include it. Do a skin of like Lord of the Rings themes for for the schemes and all that. But yeah, it's just been something that's been tinkering around in the old brain just to just to make use of all those cards that I have. Um, but that's neither here oh, nor sure. there, and totally a distraction from the point. Um, at this at this point, oh yeah. The before we get too much for it farther, of course, the Duels and Manadorks podcast you can get on Apple. Uh, no longer Google because Google doesn't do 
podcasts anymore, but Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, all podcast services around the globe. Uh, you can go to the Patreon. You can subscribe to us on Patreon for free, for free, if you so desire. Uh, you get access to ask questions for free, to ask questions uh, to, for us to read on the podcast, uh, to talk about. Uh, you can join for $5 a month to get early ad-free access, though I will say because of the nature of this main topic for this podcast, probably going to go up immediately for everyone just because I want to be like, I want to be there immediately. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to have to wait till Monday to be part of the discourse. But normally we post early ad free access for the patrons uh, on the Patreon on Wednesdays, and then it goes live in free feeds the following Mondays. Yeah, you can follow us on all the socials. We're working on getting Monday Night Magic back in, in like a spell table capacity. I need to set up OBS to make that stream possible on this PC. Uh, I've been dealing with plumbing. So I haven't been doing that. I've been I've been hooking up a washer and dryer. It's been I had to replace like the whole like uh, valve system there. It's a whole thing. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, normally I would, at this point I would then toss to Sam for the upcoming releases, but Player's Handbook's out now and Duskmorn's uh, in pre-release now. If you want to know the other dates, listen to the last podcast because we got important shit to talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Top story of the day. Commander banned and restricted announcement. This was originally made by the Commander's Rules Committee, which is separate from Wizards of the Coast. I do want to specify that. They are not associated with Wizards of the Coast. Uh, like standard, modern, pioneer, those rules committees are Wizards of the Coast rules committees. But because Commander is a casual format, is a fan-created format, it has a fan-run rules committee. Uh, this is posted to the Magic uh, website, this banned and restricted announcement. Uh, September 23rd, 2024. Four cards have been banned in the Commander format. Dockside Extortionist, Jeweled Lotus, Mana Crypt, and Nadu Wing Wisdom are all completely banned in the Commander format. Uh, they also give a, a brief update on the Silver Border Project and other initiatives that they're working on. That doesn't really matter. Uh, all of those bannings are effective on Tabletop and Magic Online immediately as of the posting of that ban. So, we're going to get into their philosophy here. We're, we're going we're gonna to quote. Okay, here's the quote. Uh, quote, the philosophy of Commander prioritizes creativity, and one of the ways we have historically reflected that in the rules and ban list is to encourage a slower pace of game than traditional formats. This gives decks time and space to develop and do different things. We have a goal to make it easier for players who enjoy slower, more social games to have an environment for them to explore. Commander has always had the potential for someone to get a fast start and be the first arch villain in the game, but that advantage has been bound Balanced by having multiple players gunning for them once it happens. In the past few years, notably since Strixhaven School of Mages, we have seen a pattern of stronger mid-game cards that allow the players to skip past the early game to snowball their advantage straight through to the win. Occasional games like that are fine, but it shouldn't be common, and we're taking steps to bring that frequency down by banning three of the most explosive plays in the format. Uh, they later go on in the mana crypt section to say uh they don't like turn six they basically say they don't like turn six to turn eight wins um in our before we get into their specific reasoning for the cards what do you think of this philosophy sam because i feel like when we are playing our commander games turn six to eight like that that would be like a little bit of a quick game for us but it's not out of the realm of possibility for our commander pods, and we're not playing Mana Crypt, Jeweled Lotus, Dockside Extortionist in our decks. I will say, uh, based on their quote, what they point out in Mana Crypt is that the the drawback of possibly losing life is no longer meaning is pretty meaningless yes. because we have 40, 40 life in our our format, and yes. getting to those six to eight turn wins, then yes. Um, but yeah, no, six to eight turns this is a this is a, a, a conversation the community has been having for you know as long as we've been playing which is has been over the past few years right after Strixhaven came out is actually right around when we started playing mm -hmm. and these six to eight turn games it seems like a very short time and yet so much can happen in that time and not to mention you know when you have four players each taking a turn um, that can last anywhere from 
uh, 30 seconds to 5, 10 minutes, this sort of thing, and we're going to get more into this later probably, but it feels like an un, uh, an, a, a, a table-to-table conversation that needs to be had and not necessarily the the law of the land, you know? Yeah. Uh, we when we've been we've been texting about this since this happened. We're recording this podcast on the twenty fourth. It's going to go up tomorrow on the twenty fifth, just to give a timeline of this. So we've had about twenty four hours to digest this banning. And when we were talking, we were specifically saying like this feels like the problem that they're trying to fix by banning these three cards is a problem that I feel like needs to happen at a rule zero conversation level before a ban list happens. Uh, with the exception of Nadu Winged Wisdom, I totally understand that. This is that Nadu's not really the the big victim here. Like we were warned about right. Nadu in the last ban list update. Uh, I mean it's it's been getting banned in literally every format that it's legal in at this point. <laughs> um I think it's it, it, in CDH tournaments it's one of the best performing decks in the time frame that it's been legal. Um, Mm -hmm. and it, it, it just creates really not great play patterns. They've admitted that it was a design mistake that they let slip through the cracks. It was, it, Nadu's, Nadu being banned, totally get it, but. (sighs) Yeah, that's fine. The, (sighs) my, my biggest, and even Dockside, like I'm not necessarily opposed to it. Uh, we got a question on the podcast several episodes ago when we were still living together about what cards we would ban in the in the commander format if we had the ability to. And we brought up Dockside Extortionist. Uh, Mana Crypt was brought up. Um, I, I'm more of a fan of not banning those things. And if I were to, I brought up like Draineth Magistrate, which just turns off your ability to cast commanders in the first place, mm-hmm. which just makes it a 100 singleton format with no special thing that makes it commander anymore. Um, right. But yeah, the, the, I, th- I think they're trying to, <sighs> one, one thing I've been seeing a lot, and I do agree with this perspective to an extent that the rules committee is attempting to fix years of design mistakes that wizards of mm-hmm. the coast has been making. And it's one of those, things where a ban like this is going to be very heavy handed and very harsh for a lot of players. But it's one of those things that we're trying to fix our format because wizards of the coast made direct print to commander cards that are way too powerful in things like jeweled Lotus, uh, refusing to reprint powerful cards that have been around for a decade that are staples in tons of formats including their most popular format in mana crypt um my problem then comes in with the timing of things like we were warned about nadu we were warned a long time ago about dockside extortionist mana crypt and jeweled lotus specifically have never once been mentioned and they came out of nowhere with this banning and particularly with jeweled lotus um Being banned in Commander basically makes it a useless card because it creates mana you can only spend on a Commander. Um, And outside of like some legacy and vintage stuff where you can manipulate and double the mana and then the mana that's doubled doesn't have the restriction of only use like that kind of stuff. It doesn't serve a purpose unless you're doing like a Commander cube or like Mm -hmm. even even the even some of the um, some of the the different like modifications to commander like oathbreaker they just follow the commander ban list so it's not yeah. like i i don't know anyway it, it's go. a very interesting thing where just last podcast 2 weeks ago we talked about a uh another attempt at a CEDH specific mm-hmm. committee for rules committee that came up and it it got quashed go listen to that episode if you want to hear more on that but part of the you know, part of that is they were always they were saying we don't necessarily want to unban cards. We in fact want to you know make bans more specifically for the high power format. And the ones they were suggesting, the one I think was Ristic Study. Yeah, not even on here. Uh, and now I understand what the rules committee is trying to do. They are trying to you know uh, they are, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but they are trying to specify what 
the format itself should be and or feel like. However, doing so, they just completely stomped on a lot, a lot, a lot of the higher power, the C not even CDH, but yet, yet, absolutely, they're stomping on a lot of CDH, they're stomping on a lot of higher power things as well, and saying, this does need to be a specific thing. Yeah, I mean, the I think the biggest problem in terms of like gameplay at most tables is not people going out and spending... $190 on a mana crypt to put into their casual commander deck. It's, oh, I bought some packs of commander masters. I cracked a jeweled lotus, so now I'm going to put it in my commander deck because I have it. And then that creates a big spike in certain games where you get access to that card, and then it spirals out of control because it's a card that's too powerful for most casual commander decks. Um, mm -hmm. Before we get too much deeper into this, I want to read their specific reasonings for the three big cards that we're talking about. So with Mana Crypt, they say, quote, coming down for no mana on turn one, it's quite possible to have an explosive start of Mana Crypt into a Signet or Talisman, land, and another Signet, leaving that player untapping five mana on turn two. Um, end quote. That seems like a Goldilocks hand in a lot of ways, but a turn one Mana Crypt into... Arc into Arcane Signet, land, and casting a spell is also very, very powerful as well. And that one's just kind of a more mm -hmm. normal thing. Uh, quote, In games going over 12 turns, the accumulated threat of damage from Mana Crypt provides a reasonable counterbalance for its explosive effect. But when you are snowballing to a turn 6 to 8 win, it's, mean it's a meaningless drawback, end quote. So this is what I was bringing up with the turn 6 to 8 win. They don't necessarily want that. They want the mm -hmm. games to be going longer up to 12 turns. But I feel like in our experience at a lot of casual commander games, uh, getting to a turn 12 is when the game becomes a bit of a slog in a lot of ways. And that might just be our own bias because we play, we've played a lot of one-on-one -on -one commander games with our Monday yeah. Night Magic live streams. But even when we're playing four-player games, I still feel like, like if we're getting to turn 10, like someone's presenting wins regularly, like every mm -hmm. single turn at that point. Um, all right, before we get too much deeper, Jeweled Lotus, they specifically say, quote, another card that can give you five mana on turn two, Jeweled Lotus does it with even without even needing a good hand. Though you're restricted in what you can do with the mana, four and five mana commanders can pack a significant punch nowadays, often drawing cards to make up for the one-shot mana and defensive abilities such as Ward that can't be interacted with that early in the game. Uh, and then we'll do Dockside Extortionists, where they say, quote, Dockside isn't normally quite as explosive in the early game as the other two cards, but it can still go mana positive on turn two and start generating substantial treasures after that. It's been given on the it's been on the border for years. We've shied away from acting in the past because the card has scaled well with the power level of the table, but it's a frequent contributor contributor to the more egregious snowballing starts, end quote. Um those reasonings for what they want to do with Commander make perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's one of those they they've they talk with Wizards of the Coast regularly about their thought processes for banning, uh, what cards they're looking at and considering. And I wouldn't be surprised if things like Orcish Bowmasters, the One Ring, Ristic Study, that kind of stuff are things that they are looking at. But mm -hmm. we don't know because they haven't told us what they're looking at. Yeah. In the last two years, since we've really started playing Magic, Dockside, Jeweled Lotus, and Mana Crypt have been reprinted a couple of times as big chase cards for expensive sets. Jeweled Lotus was the chase card for Commander Masters a year ago. Jeweled Lotus had like four different arts for it. And it was one that if you pulled, you had a really good box, a booster box, a really good pack, a really good collector, whatever. Mana Crypt, they reprinted like seven new art versions of it in Lost Caverns of Ixalan, not even a year ago. Mm -hmm. Dockside Extortionist also got a reprint in Commander Masters. And I believe there was a remastered set that also had a reprint for it. I don't remember specifically. 
they've been they've mentioned that they've been looking at these bannings for over a year and a half now, which is before when those sets have been coming out and. Wizards of the Coast would have known that and has been choosing to make these cards chase cards, have not been reprinting them, have not gotten the price down. So now I want to get into the price aspect of it because this is something that is particularly affecting the CEDH community. Um, You're buying, like many CEDH decks are buying multiple copies or players are buying multiple copies of Mana Crypt, Dockside Extortionist, to a lesser extent Jeweled Lotus, but still many Jeweled Lotuses for a lot of their decks. The fast mana that these cards provided created a way for lower tier CEDH decks to be competitive. You know, mm-hmm. you look at um, you look at one of the new one of the newer um, Rakdos cards, the the Captive Kingpin, the one where it deals yes. one where if you deal exactly one damage, you get to exile a card and then you can cast that card. Um, that deck in CEDH. Really, it was only viable because of the fast mana that you needed to be able to cast him early through Mana Crypt, Jeweled Lotus, Soul Ring, which we'll get to later, and then Treasures from Dockside Extortionist to create loops in red. Magda is getting, like, a, a, one of the top tier CEDH decks, getting a massive power down because Magda cares a ton about treasures. Like, that entire deck is built around treasures and removing your best generator of treasures through Dockside Extortionist just massively powers that deck down and honestly the only cd obviously nadu getting banned out of existence removes one of the top three decks in the format entirely um and the only decks that are really benefiting from this are the top two decks in the format that don't really need these cards because they have access to a ton of colors and a ton of combo lines that are unrelated to these cards uh, and that being blue farm which is tim necrom partner and then rog Sai, which is rog rack silas uh, Grixis combo and because of these bannings I feel like CEDH is going it's going to adapt and there are a lot of CEDH players that are very excited about the new app possibilities in the format but we've just funneled all of that money mm-hmm. into Wizards of the Coast who have been making print chase cards that these players are buying en masse Many I've seen pictures on Twitter of CDH players that pull out seven copies of their Mana Crypt, yeah, a card that the minimum was one hundred and ninety dollars. Many copies of Jeweled Lotus. Uh, I've seen a dozen Dockside Extortionists. That there, these are thousands of dollars worth of cards that should never have gotten to this point to begin with. It's, yeah. So I mean. Just looking at the price, yeah, look, looking at those price points. If you uh, go on to CCG Player, you can they'll show you um, a graph of how the prices have been, mm-hmm. and these you know these specific cards have been up there. Uh, looking at the price points today, market price on each of them is about half of what it was yesterday before the bans. And so, of course, yes, that fe- that's one a feel bad for any players anybody who's buying these specific cards specifically to play them in the game but then also it feels bad for anybody that is a collector or a game Mm -hmm. store owner who has or or or, you know so many game stores is a great point yeah it's so many of these card uh you know of these people now just have a collection that got that may have gotten cut in half in price um and and we, you know, can't, one we can't do, if we can't they, do if we bannings ban- around we can't do bannings around what the price of cards are either but it's a right. big big feel bad oh yeah and it's it's i'm sure it's you know we're not just again we when we're talking about this we're not just talking about the effects these cards are having on the gameplay we're talking you know we're going to we're going to be talking about how the community feels now um we uh Texted, uh, texted one of the, our friends who plays a lot of CEDH yesterday after the ban was announced, and his reaction was, "I'm done with it," you know. Yeah. And that's at, at, you know that is no the the price, the how the decks play, the how you have to construct decks. You know, now you've you've at least for a lot of CEDH players, you've uh, pointed to this and said, "Here, build a car without nuts and bolts." Mm-hmm. So. 
And this obviously hits CDH the hardest. Uh, and the monetary loss is very, very big. It should never have gotten to that point in the first place. Like, Wizards should have been reprinting these cards. The the rules committee should have mentioned Mana Crypt and Jeweled Lotus if they were this looking into it this heavily. Um, if they were looking into it this heavily to ban those two cards, then they should have been in the conversation on these previous rule on these previous ban uh ban and restriction announcements so that the community was aware of it and if they wanted to get out of those cards they could but now people are locked into these cards and uh w- I, one company cool stuff inc um they specifically were tweeting out like hey remember if you bought a card in the last 15 days and it got banned we'll give you a full refund on it if you send the card back so like there's some places that that that's okay, but there. But I've I've been even seeing clips of people that are opening up packages of cards that they ordered this week. Yeah, that are then worth several dozens of dollars less, hundred dollars less than they were when they purchased it, and that that's a very very big feel bad. Um, in terms of getting out of CEDH, I'm sure there are a lot of people that are going to get out of that format now, uh, which is not it's not fun because cdh is a very interesting and it plays very different than casual commander it looks like a lot of fun and Mm -hmm. i'm trying to get into it myself um i i think the cdh will be fine it will adapt it is a very very big feel bad for all of the people that have really really invested in that format and invested in that community and coming after Two weeks after um, everyone basically canceling a, a the CEDH rules committee and being like, no, we don't need yeah. that. It 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 puts into stark contrast, like maybe why exactly it needs to be its own format. Um, commander is very unique. It competitive commander. The difference between competitive and casual commander. That doesn't exist in other formats. If you're playing standard, you're trying to play competitive standard. If you're playing modern, you're playing competitive modern. There's not like casual modern. There's not casual pioneer. There's not casual any of these formats. And doing bans specifically for the casual player feels really not good. Yeah. Especially with their comment about uh, a card that a lot of people have been saying is in this same category, which is Soul Ring. Mm -hmm. Here's what they have to say about Soul Ring. Quote, We should also talk about the elephant in the room. We are not banning Soul Ring and have no desire to. Yes, based on the criteria we've talked about here, it would be banned. Soul Ring is the iconic card of the format, and it's sufficiently tied to the identity of the format that it defies the laws of physics in a way that no other card does. Banning Soul Ring would be fundamentally changing the identity of the format. We aren't trying to eliminate all explosive starts. It happen, it's happening every once in a while is exciting, and removing the other three cards geometrically reduces the number of hands capable of substantial above curd mana generation in the first few turns, end quote. That just seems like playing favoritism, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Soul yeah, Ring is a slightly more expensive mana crypt without the downside of mana crypt. That's all it is. Yeah. And because it's been print reprinted to death in all of these commander decks, it's fine. So what you're saying is if they were printing, if they were putting a jeweled Lotus in every single pre-con for the last year, would jeweled Lotus have been fine? Because everybody would have had it. Would, would mana right. crypt have been fine if they were reprinting it to death? If they put Dockside in like a commander deck every set, would it have been fine? It, it only seems, it, with that comment about Soul Ring, it really gives the feeling that the only reason Dockside, Jeweled Lotus, and Mana Crypt are bad is because not everybody has them. And Soul Ring is fine because everybody has it. Yeah. Yeah. It, if and if that's the case, then we need to encourage. Um, we need to be. We need to encourage um, people to. Or we need to encourage wizards to reprint these expensive cards, because it never should have gotten to this point. 
Um, if we want to talk about Nadu, we can. Obviously, it was a design mistake. They admitted that. Uh, it creates really boring play patterns, non-deterministic lines. Um, I don't think people are really playing it at a casual level because they understand that intuitively, that it's a busted card. Uh, it took over a lot of CEDH tournaments. It's mm -hmm. not the best deck in the CEDH format, but it was certainly up and coming and in the top five, top three conversation, winning a lot of tournaments. Um, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like Nadu being banned is fine. Uh, it's kind of a feel bad for me. I was working on a CEDH uh, Nadu, Nadu deck because I pulled like four Nadus during Modern Horizons 3. It was ridiculous. Uh, but I mean, it it is what it is. The bird's going to be banned in like every format, so yeah, it's only a matter of time. And then the formats it'll be legal in, it's not going to be good enough. So you know, no, um, no. yeah. No. Ultimately, ultimately, to put a to put a bow on this, Wizards needs to change how they handle the secondary market in reprinting of cards. Uh, they also need to be much more careful about designing cards specifically for commander which is a casual format that was designed to just be something you do in between games of another format mm -hmm. uh, i think if they went back and just started designing cards again for standard and modern and just let some of the cards that were good in those formats trickle into commander i mean modern horizons 3 there are cards that are very 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 good in modern that are also good in commander because commander can just mm -hmm. let you do anything you want um, I don't really have much more to say about this other than it's just, it really sucks. Feels bad. Um, I would, part of me wouldn't be surprised at all if they go back on banning some of these cards in the coming weeks. Uh, but I don't anticipate that happening at all. Honestly. Um, what do, what do you have to say about the death of these very yeah. expensive cards? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, as it, uh, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of these cards were often cards that we were recommended to talk to our table about in in power level conversations, rule zero conversations. And I think that obviously we might be seeing, you know, maybe maybe this is a conversation having the other the other direction now. Like, hey, now, we, now that we're going to play, you know, we want to play high power, maybe we, for this table, unban them or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the identity of the format itself is not going to change with these the identity of the overall commander format is not going to change with these um and and i think that there a lot of people maybe who uh like to play exclusively lower power games and maybe don't consider you know the other the other the other people in the format uh are happy about this i've definitely seen all of these directions on you know all these takes online whether it's people are super happy with this banning people are super unhappy with this banning uh but i i i think a lot's going to unfold here in the next couple of weeks yeah yeah uh i wouldn't be at this point i wouldn't even be surprised if the november banning that they're going to be or the november banned and restricted announcement on the 18th um we're probably going to start looking at things like Ristic Study, like what the One Ring, like Orcish Bowmasters. Uh, I feel like a lot of these vaguely problematic cards at casual tables are going to start getting getting looked at now. Um, obviously, the Commander Rules Committee can't cater to CEDH, which is why they were trying to make their own rules committee in the first place. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, brand, a new effort uh, to do that now that maybe has different people or maybe people are now more okay with it than they were two weeks ago. Who knows? Yeah. But um, if you have the cards, tough shit. I lost like $200 in value in two cards. I didn't actually buy them. I pulled them from packs. So. No, they were sitting it, on the wall for the longest time. Exactly. They're, it's totally fine. They're going to end up in uh, a Sauron commander deck for a game of kingdoms at some point because uh, it, fuck it. Who cares? All right. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah, exactly. Moving on. We have three, four really secret layer things to talk about. Um, I mean, we're going to do this kind of wrap up style. So we have, let me drag this over here. Okay. We have four announced 
uh, secret layers. There's also been a leak that I've seen of a Marvel secret layer drop uh, that is not the Marvel uh, Universes Beyond set that we are doing. But the ones that have been announced, uh, the first one, we have Chucky, the horror movie, Chucky. Uh, not the Rugrats. Not the Rugrats, no. No, that would be, that'd be a hell of a secret layer. That would be a weird one. That would be a weird one. Uh, the prices that we are referencing for all of these are use are using a TCG player. Uh, Chucky is including. Ooh, okay, hold on. Let me get the specific new names for this. So Chucky himself is a Carter Doom Scourge. Uh, sorry, Jack. Chucky's back is. Oh my God! The zoom on this thing. My goodness is a Phyrexian Reclamation, uh, which is an enchantment, Graveyard Recursion. Uh, Tiffany, Bride of Chucky, is Varagoth, Blood Sky, Sire. Uh, Friends to the End is a Twin Flame. And Pal Play Pal's Factory is a Genesis Chamber. If we were to go over the monetary value of these cards, uh, Carter Doom Scourge is forty cents, seventy-five in foil. Phyrexian Reclamation is three fifty or four twenty-four foil is the market price, but they were all sold out, and the and the only one that was for sale was forty dollars. Uh, Varagoth Blood Sky Sire is twelve or two twelve and four fourteen in foil. Twin Flame a dollar twenty nine or three ninety nine in foil, and then Genesis Chamber is a dollar twenty or seven o one in foil for a total of nine dollars and twenty one cents worth of cards for thirty dollars in non foil, or twenty dollars and twelve cents of cards for forty dollars in foil, or if you go by what is available for Phyrexian Reclamation, that would be fifty five eighty eight. Uh, the art on them is pretty cool if you like Chucky, but the monetary value, not really there. No. No. Uh, I will be passing on this one, obviously. I'm not a Chucky I guy. also will be passing on this one. Uh, we got two Ghostbusters secret layer drops. The first one is based on the movies, specifically. We have Pernicious Deed, which is 478 or 758 in foil. Trickbind, which is a very... It's not really ever been reprinted. It's like a split second, um, a split second counter spell for mm -hmm. like activated abilities and triggered abilities. Twenty eight thirty four in non foil with forty dollars in foil because it's only been printed once. Uh, Mimeoplasm, on the other hand, has been reprinted to high hell, and that is eight cents or thirty nine cents in foil. Windfall, the white wheel is, or the blue wheel is two fifteen or four fifty five in foil, and then Incarnation Technique is five ninety one or seven sixty eight in foil for a total value in non foil of forty one twenty six, with a total foil value of sixty dollars and twenty cents. Uh, basically entirely on the back of the trick bind reprint um trick bind is a card that i have never heard of before yeah, but I haven't either when it it's also slimed which is hilarious <laughs> but split split second counter target activated or triggered ability if a permanence ability is countered this way activated abilities of that permanent cannot be activated for one in a blue it's not like a counter spell per se, but it's a very powerful counter magic. Yeah. Um, I will not be partaking in it though. The mana val or the monetary value of the cards, particularly the foil, uh, the foil value is probably worth it. If you're in the market for any of these cards or if, ultimately, ultimately, if you're into the monetary investment of them, as long as you're close to the price point for regular prints, the secret layer prints are going to be more valuable. Like the the particularly with popular things like Ghostbusters, like the Monty Python cards are way more are worth way more than what I paid for them. But that's just because yeah. they're the Monty Python printing of the cards. <laughs> Uh, we have the Ghostbusters animated series secret lair. Uh, we are getting a reprint of unlicensed hearse which is an 82 cent card or dollar 24 in foil eladamri's call a very powerful tutor is 575 or 1572 in foil boros charm a dollar 89 or 98 or three dollars in foil living end which is three dollars and nine cents or seven dollars in foil 
Careful Study, which is $1.21 or $20 in foil, is a very rare foil. And the Soul Guide Lantern was not shown in the official reveal, but it will be included in the secret lair as Ghost Trap. Uh, a nine cent card or 15 cents in foil for a total of twelve ninety four non foil and forty seven eleven in foil entirely on the back of the careful study reprint. Um, these cards seem much more generally useful, uh, particularly mm-hmm. Eladomri's call and Boros charm uh, will seem like they go in a whole lot of decks. Um, and notably, this is a six card secret layer as opposed to the now relatively normal five card secret layers that we've been getting. A um, little bit more value here. And I personally am more of a fan of the Ghostbusters animated art personally. But if you're into the art, have at it. If you want an animated Slimer who's got glasses and a book called toblin's spirit guide that he's reading in careful study then have at it but we're not really ghostbusters people that's always that's always going to be the recommendation when it comes to secret layers if you like the art go for it mm-hmm. most of the time most of the time sometimes there's an expensive reprint and not a lot of other value sometimes you get a little lucky though one of the times you're not going to get lucky is the new hatsune miku electric entourage secret lair uh a an entirely planeswalker secret lair you get a reprint of freyer lease lana wars fury which is a dollar eight or a dollar 73 in foil jace unraveler of secrets a dollar 67 or 280 in foil elspeth tyrell which is a 48 cent planeswalker i didn't know those existed or 11.99 in foil (laughs) it's had one foil printing uh, Liliana of the Dark Realms, a former uh, a former boogeyman of many formats, now mm-hmm. only four thirty five or eighteen dollars in foil because of a single foil printing, and Royal Scions. If you were if you were concerned by a forty eight cent planeswalker, how do you think a sixteen cent planeswalker is, or not even a dollar eighty four cents in foil for a total non foil value of seven forty eight that you spent thirty dollars on. Or a total foil value of thirty five thirty six that you spend forty dollars on. Uh, this is a hard pass, hard hard pass. And yeah, if you you might get lucky and you might see online like they include bonus cards in these all the time that they don't reveal until the cards get sent out. There might be a very expensive bonus card you can get, but do not buy secret layers for the possibility of getting an expensive bonus card. That is silly. What um, I have heard, though, you oh. can get the Japanese versions much cheaper. Oh, really? Yeah. And and with how Hatsune Miku is, I mean, I feel like the Japanese versions might be more desirable based on the... Who knows? The, the people that they are trying to get. Um, so, yeah, that's... Don't buy Secret Layers unless you really like the the property that they're adapting with it. Um, there was a leak, a rumored... Magic the Gathering Marvel Secret Lair. Uh, We are getting, of course, the Marvel Universes Beyond set in 2025. This is not that. Uh, But we have seen a a somewhat blurry picture of stacks of four seemingly secret lair new design cards. Uh, We get Black Panther, uh, which is a Selesnya card. Hold on, let me get... Come on. Let me zoom in. I'm just trying to zoom in on a card. All right. Black Panther, (laughs) Wakandan King. Green and white, 2-2 for a legendary human noble hero. Uh, They are all heroes as part of the card type. Uh, First Strike and Survey the Realm. Whenever Black Panther or another creature you control enters, you put a plus one, plus one counter on a target land you control. And then Mine Vibranium, where you can pay... I think that is three to move all plus one plus one counters from target land you control onto target creature. If one or more plus one plus one counters are moved this way, you gain that much life and draw a card. Uh, Interesting way to store plus one plus one counters and be able to move them around a little bit, which is interesting. Um, Weird take on a token strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Eh, I don't. I don't know. Vague, vaguely thematic because they mine vibranium, I guess. Uh, Iron Man, Titan of Innovation, three blue red for a four four human hero, legendary artifact creature, human hero, uh, flying haste, and genius industrialist. Whenever Iron Man attacks, create a treasure token. Then you may sacrifice a non-creature artifact. If you do, search your library for an artifact card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrificed artifact's mana value. Put it onto the battlefield tapped and then shuffle. We've seen that kind of effect before uh, with various artifact tutors. Um, He's Iron Man, so he's cool. Wolverine, (laughs) best there is. Uh, One red green for a 2 2 legendary creature, mutant berserker hero uh, with unrivaled lethality. Double all damage Wolverine would deal. At the beginning of each end step, if Wolverine dealt damage to another creature this turn, you put a plus one plus one counter on him. You can also pay one and a green to regenerate him. Uh, this one is very, very thematic for Wolverine in particular with his like rapid healing abilities. And that would that would that seems like a very powerful gruel commander deck with like bite and fight spells and if you give him like double strike or first strike and it, it ridiculously powerful. Uh, the most thematic one in my estimation though, Captain America, first Avenger for red, white, and blue, <laughs> a four, four human soldier hero with throw dot, dot, dot. You pay three, you unattach an equipment from Captain America. He deals damage equal to that equipment's mana value divided as you choose among one, two or three targets. And then dot, 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 Catch. At the beginning of combat on your turn, attach up to one target equipment you control to Captain America. Uh, a Jeskai equipment deck where you're where you're getting value from unequipping and re-equipping equipment onto Cap. Uh, I just love that they reordered the mana symbols to make it red, white, and blue specifically for him. <laughs> Uh, it is it is a leak. It's not official. It seems very cool and thematic. I'm sure we'll start seeing that in the lead up to the full set. Um, the Magic the Gathering Netflix show is not canceled, apparently. That's an interesting thing. I don't really have much to say about that. Uh, the last thing, this is not magic related for those of you that stuck around for Daggerheart news. Uh, they just put up pre-order for the official Daggerheart set. Uh, you can go to their website. It is $40 for the regular uh, Daggerheart stuff. Um, oh my gosh. Where is it? Don't make me choose my region. I'm just trying to see the prices, damn it. Uh, Daggerheart core set is $59.99, sorry. And that includes the rule book and a nice case that contains all of the cards that you would need for creating your characters. Uh, and then the Daggerheart core set limited edition is $149.99. Uh, it, includes, it includes all the core set stuff plus uh, extras and unique art. Uh, it will never be made again. It also contains... Um, what is that? A special set of dice for the hope and fear dice, uh, an alternate cover, a GM screen tokens and more. All of these are pay in full when you check out and they will ship in the spring of 2025. So Daggerheart is finally coming out of beta for all of those that are interested. We tried doing a, uh, a Daggerheart beta game, but it kind of, it kind of fell through on the, on the scheduling front, sadly. Yeah. As if so you're into that, do as as the adults we are. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, check it out. I think Daggerheart's going to be a really cool format, or uh, a really cool. It's not a format. It's not magic. <laughs> a really cool game uh, for people. Uh, moving on to questions that we take from the audience over on Patreon. You can join for free to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. We post a thread every single week on friday the friday before we record you have the entire weekend to submit your requests uh we get one from our boy brandon who just wants who just wanted to say uh i think it i think duskmorn is one of the best sets of the year duskmorn for the win uh, so uh i think i think he's a bit more of a uh of a duskmorn fan than than we are a more of a horror fan than we are uh he also specifically mess- messaged us uh, to get our thoughts on the ban list. And he said, uh, 
it's crazy. I agree. It's absurd. Value in those cards is probably going to drop now. And he said, I can still play. I can mm-hmm. still build the Nadu deck. I was telling him, I was like, oh, I can't build my Nadu CEDH deck. He's like, yeah, you can. Just don't play it in tournaments. And I'm like, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I probably won't. But. There you go. Uh, yeah, that is that is all we got today. Um, kind of glossed over a lot of stuff just because it was going to be a slow news week. We were going to really dive into the secret layers and stuff because that would be all we had to talk about. And then they decided to ban out three of the most expensive cards in the format for us. So yeah. glad glad they did that before we recorded, <laughs> not after. <laughs> but yeah, uh, this no, this will no go panic sessions. No panic, no panic. Uh, yeah, we'll be posting this one live for free feeds immediately. Uh, normally we do early ad free access over on patreon.com slash dungeon bros and all that kind of stuff. Sam, you got anything you want to say before we, uh, before we wrap this up and, and tell the people, f- give them their, our fondest farewells. Of course. Uh, before we, before we go, I should say just because there's always going to, there's always news. And just because it's happening doesn't mean, uh, we need to freak out immediately. So we hope that our takes on, uh, on on the bands this week have been have been level headed have been thoughtful and hopefully uh provoke you to think more and react less yes but other than that more more immediate uh silence and mm-hmm. thought and less immediate outbursts and reactions yeah. i will say i follow a lot uh on the dungeon bros twitter account you can follow us x.com slash dungeon bros i think maybe just look up the Dungeon Bros. Sure. But Twitter. Go to Twitter. We follow we follow a lot of CEDH creators, and I will say a lot of them have been outspoken in their disappointment of the lack of communication of the bands specifically. But I've also been seeing a lot of CEDH creators that are excited for what this will do to the format and the mm-hmm. new possibilities and the new decks that are gonna crop up because of it. Um, obviously a lot of decks are going to go away, which is very sad. Uh, but it, it, it's a new, it's a new day for CEDH. So yes, keep yourselves, keep yourselves calm, level-headed, think before you speak and all of that. And, uh, as always, we love you very much. 